Before we get into it, I just wanted to thank you for following me into this tilted rabbit hole where we learn about the entrepreneur journey and all the magnificent and terrifying things that come with it. If you're an entrepreneur and you want to increase your brand exposure, network internationally, and gain insights, then follow the breadcrumbs in the show notes to my website where you can find everything you need to start your business, grow your brand, and accelerate your income today. I even have a live show every Monday that you can attend. It's free brand awareness and exposure, and you get to meet some really cool people on the show. It's such incredible value, and you don't have to pay a penny for it. Now it's time. Let's jump straight into the rabbit hole. Let's get to it. Um, do you want to tell us your name, your company, and a little bit about what you do? Sure. So my name is Gozika. My middle name is Victoria. And my last name is Onyekwiru. I always give my first and my middle name in case people are not comfortable with my first name. So, And my company is called The Bright Future Project. Um, we are a very small waste management and recycling company in Zambia. Um, the company, the concept started in 2014, but I don't really think you want me to run through all of that. Um, you probably read it on my LinkedIn, but we registered in 2016. We didn't start operations until 2nd of March 2020. And that was because all that time I've been looking, I was looking for investment. And it suddenly dawned on me that the more I was trying to look for this large amount of money, the further away my vision was going. So, and the more demoralized I was actually feeling. So I said to myself, let me start with what I have which is basically $30 and three clients, um, $30 for fuel. I borrowed a friend's truck and we went to collect for three clients. And as the weeks progressed, more and more clients joined. Um, we collect separated waste. And the idea was to have our own recycling facilities so we can um, recycle the waste. We wanted to compost the organic waste, um, turn the glass waste back into sand, because there are currently no glass recyclers at all in Zambia. So oh, wow. if ever we get the chance to, um, we would be the first. Um, unfortunately, I never, I was never able to reach the recycling stage because I just, you know, never had the investment, never had the team, never had a, a proper financial um, advisor to help with, you know, funding, grants and all of that malarkey. And um, I was basically just running the company, you know, on a day to day basis. And um, we now have 80 clients, just over 80 clients. Oh, um, that's amazing. Their, including the American Embassy, um, the Irish Ambassador, um, a huge business park. At, in 2021, I actually had over 100 clients. But um, due to lack of capacity and bad service delivery, um, we lost you know, a major client, which was a big shopping mall and a few others. But, you know, that's always expected. So it didn't really, it wasn't something that really knocked me back. I'm, I'm very stubborn mm -hmm. and, you know, and I'm, I'm a very determined person. So once I have a goal in mind, it's just, I just go right ahead and I don't get demoralized that easily. So. Mm -hmm. During the whole process, the company evolved into consultancy. Um, we um, were asked by um, Nando's um, mm -hmm. specifically to do an impact assessment on how their restaurants can use less plastic. Um, we were asked um, to Lake Tanganyika to see how we can help the uh, the harbour minimize the amount of waste that's in the lake 
Mm -hmm. um, we were asked to do some proposals um, by Coca-Cola and Nestle, but I learned my lesson. I was excited dealing with big companies, didn't yeah. make them sign NDA or anything like that, gave them the proposals and off they went, never heard back from them ever again. <laughs> Well, so, these are all teething. These are all teething things, and you know, you've really got that entrepreneurial spirit about you. I absolutely love that. I love the stubbornness because I do think <laughs> that that stubbornness, that persistence, that insistence is really, really what we need as entrepreneurs. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Because even as a woman going into the waste sector, I didn't realize how cartels the waste management is. You can is it? some really very, very one of the directors of the company is a Scottish gentleman called Steve Taylor, and he was telling me the same thing. You can meet some really nasty people, nasty people in, in waste management because it's very territorial. So even going into it as a woman in Africa, you can just imagine the kind yeah. of response that I was getting. One gentleman just said, you know what, I'm sure you've got better things to do. Why don't, why don't you just go home and forget about all of this? And oh, you know, even the, council, even the council, the municipality, they just weren't being cooperative at all. So I just said to myself, you know, I don't need any of these people yeah let me start and then let them see what I can do and then when they're ready they'll come to me which 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 is exactly what they did so occasionally I do give the council some advice not too much because there's still things that I would like to barter from them um so um we 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 went into some consultancy um I do presentations for um, the Ministry of Commerce and other ministries around the circular economy and innovation, because I think innovation is a very important aspect that Africa yeah. lacks. And when you use the circular economy, the green economy, and talk to people about the potential it has, you never know, you might be speaking Next Mark Zuckerberg, the next Jeff Bezos, I go into rural areas and I teach young women, um, um, even young men, about the potential that waste has, the yeah. fact that waste is a resource and you actually can earn some kind of living from it. And I think just by talking to people, you can inspire people, you know, you don't necessarily have to give somebody money um, or anything you know, physical for them to make a success of their lives. All you need to do is just plant an idea in their head, regardless of whether they have, ha have had a formal education or not. So um, I did spend a lot of time traveling around to rural areas, um, talking to organizations, speaking to women, speaking to girls, especially um, because Part of our CSR is gender-based violence yeah. and um, and helping girls who've been sexually abused. There are no facilities available um, for women at all in Zambia. There are no shelters. There's no counselling. The police don't care. So, you know, if nobody cares, who's going to care, you know? And if you're trapped in a house... Um, with a bully and you can't leave because you're financially dependent on somebody you know it's it, it's sad it's heartbreaking so I felt yeah. it was important to teach them rudimentary business skills and rudimentary ways in which they can um, start their own businesses at home so that they can start generating income so if need be and they want to leave then they don't have an excuse, a financial ex excuse anyway, um, to, to stay in the house. So yeah. that really was, um, it really so, still is. That is, it, it's, it's actually quite surprising because, you know, we, we sit in here in the UK and don't realise how incredibly lucky and privileged we are here. Yeah. Because we've got a lot of these services. We've got everything here. 
I mean, I know that we do, comp everyone complains about the NHS, but they're doing their best. But yes. overall, it's an absolute privilege to live in a first world country because I grew up out in Trinidad and mm -hmm. there are there, there are two women's shelters that I'm aware of and there are some communities and but to be completely honest the, it's the community that actually pulls together and mm. deals with stuff like that so if you have somebody who's being abused then people your neighbors will actually jump in people do get involved they're not afraid mm. to go hey you're not supposed to be doing that or what do you think you're doing mm. you know exactly. and yeah. I think that the the my experience of living abroad and now coming back to the UK it you know you you kind of also get used to it and you do get comfortable thinking well you know well this mm. is because this is now this is now my my new normal whereas mm. you forget that there are countries out there that don't have these kind of systems in place where mm. the police do not get involved with you know domestic abuse and sexual violence yes. yeah especially yeah. violence against women and it's very sad it's very sad because um they may catch a pedophile um or a rapist but all they need to do is bribe them is bribe the police you know and yeah they're out in in yeah. the same day and it just goes to show you um the mindset that 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 we have in africa and to be honest with you, the mindset of my own people is what disappointed me the most when I went there. You know, yeah. it was it was it was incredible. Firstly, you know, because of my accent. Well, you know, the fact that I I've been privileged enough to go to the best private schools in this country, you know, and I use that as an advantage. And um people just think oh um, they just have these preconceived ideas of who they think that you are and then yeah. you also have the cultural barriers as well the man yeah. is the head of the house the man owns his, his wife the man can beat up his wife there's some cultures that allow pedophilia um, to, um, to, to happen and, and and such like so you know it's 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 the minds that we have yeah. to change and you can go on as much as you like about colonialism and so on and so forth if you're a slave in your mind then you're just a slave full stop and um, once you decide to break free and to open your mind and to welcome ideas and not be frightened of change then I think Africa really has got a better chance of evolving. But yeah. as it is right now, our evolution is stunted. And it's not because of colonialism. It's not because of white people. It's not because of foreign investment. It's because of our own, uh, our own selves. We are our worst enemies, our own worst enemies. And it was saddening. The, just the hatred between the people is, yeah. is, was depressing enough but not depressing enough for me to 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 not want to do what I was doing yeah um and you know no I think I sometimes that... sometimes situations like that give you a little bit of fire as well it gives you a bit of fire in your mm -hmm. belly to go do you know what mm -hmm. I want to be the change I want to push change in this place I need to push yeah. change in this place you have to you have to push change why isn't anybody advocating for it but yeah. what you have in Zambia instead are people wanting to um, drive big cars people building mansions the gap yeah. between the poor and the rich is just massive uh, it's outstanding it's terrible yeah I I can relate to that entirely it is exactly the same in the Caribbean where you've literally got there's no middle anymore it's literally it's either you're wealthy or you're not and if you're not then you are literally living in poverty and I didn't realize that I was living in poverty for most of my life out there until I moved here and was no longer living in poverty and then I was able to look around and go actually this is what life you know really kind of should be 
not that yeah. I was even like well off here it was just no this is this is normal this is this is mm. this is I'm I'm no longer fighting to survive every day I'm now mm. okay bills are yeah. paid I don't have to worry about you know if I have enough money for food on the last week of the month mm. that is it's it's it is heartbreaking to see a large percentage of the world that still lives like that in 2023 we're moving into 2024 and you know I think I think we talk about climate change we talk about all of that stuff and the biggest biggest issue that we have really is global poverty it is it is and what's even worse is how the rich people treat the poor, you know, yeah. when it comes to like domestic workers, um, you know, um, employees. Yeah. It's just, it's just incredible. It's really incredible. Mm. It's like, it's like the indigenous Zambians have, have stepped into the boots of the colonial masters and have just picked up, you know, um, where they, um, where they left, where they left from and, and it's just for as much as I am a very stubborn woman, I have slightly lost my faith in humanity because I think that there are less and less good people out there. Yeah, you know, no, I get day, that. You know, it's very difficult to wake up in the morning and from morning to evening, you've actually met somebody who's actually pure, um, who wants the best for you, who inspires yeah. you, who motivates you, you know, more and more, you know, everybody's becoming more selfish, you know, everybody always has an agenda and you just never yes. know, you know what, what, what that agenda is. So because I've been through so much trauma from the hands of people, I am so weary now and I'd, I've never been, ever since I was a child, I've never really had friends, you know. But even now I can say that my only friend is Jesus because I can't see myself opening up um, to people. And that, and that includes family members as well because yeah. at the end of the day, they may be your family. but Sometimes just family can be the worst. They are the worst. They are the worst. And... Um, you know, I mean, this year for me, I was actually when I came back from Zambia at the end of twenty two, end of end, end of twenty twenty two, I had to come back because I had micromanaged the company so much. My everything, my whole being was focused on the bright future projects that I just yeah. completely neglected myself, and. You know, I I wasn't controlling the lupus very well, so I yeah. had to come back and and see my doctors. And um, usually, um, I would be with my aunt, um, because mm-hmm. um, I've always, I mean, I was in boarding school, but when I wasn't, and when I was in the country, I would stay with my aunt. But she lived, um, she sold her house, bought a new one, and she was also squatting with yeah. somebody else because. My house wasn't ready. So I went to live with their great aunt, who just turned out to be so evil and wicked. Um, I actually ended up in this. So um, from January to, say, March, um, yeah. I was in shelters. And oh we were sleeping in a different church. We would sleep in different churches every night. But during the day, you didn't have anywhere to go. And, you know, it's, it's really cold during that time. And my social worker um, found me a temporary shelter um, in, in northwest London um, from the end of March. Um, and even there, you know, there's murderers there, pedophiles there, rapists there, crackheads there. You know, um, as grateful as I was that I had a shelter, um, yeah. it still wasn't something that that brought much joy to me but strangely enough throughout this whole process 
I just gave thanks every day. And to this day, I give thanks for that experience because it opened up a whole new world to me. And I met the most incredible people. The yeah. kind of community and love and camaraderie that there is amongst the homeless is just absolutely unbelievable. And I'm still in touch with a lot of uh, my friends. They still call me, you know, they, and I'm still in touch with them. And, you know, it's like, yeah, there's a little family. I was the only woman in the group and um, we were a group of 10 and the rest were, were gentlemen, you know, from Iran, from Afghanistan, from Eastern Europe, from, from the UK. And just listening to people's stories as to how they ended up where they are, it, it, it was just, it was heartbreaking for me. And it left, me feeling if I'm not doing enough you know yeah I'm not showing enough love because what people really want at the end of the day is to feel loved and of course everybody I think that's that's yeah. that's part of the human condition it's just we yeah. want to feel loved and we want to belong somewhere yeah. we are yeah. forever hunting for our tribe and for somebody and for somebody to listen to your story so if I can incorporate anything that I've been through this year into what I'm doing in Zambia for the women and the girls there, then, you know, that will be even, it will be a bonus for me, you know, so, because counselling and giving somebody a voice and letting them tell their story is so important just for somebody to be listened to. And for them to feel that, okay, somebody is listening to me. Yeah. It's extremely important. And I feel that maybe that's where um, my work really hasn't been done yet. So I'm grateful. Well, you've got, you're, I, you're young. You're young. You're vibrant. You're an incredible inspiration. And I have no doubt that this is part of, that's going to be a huge, huge, huge part of your future and yeah I mean so I don't, I'm going to be 46 in a few months so <laughs> oh I couldn't tell could not tell <laughs> but um, like so... for those listening I mean you have an incredible story you have literally seen every part of life like what what can people do for those who who are listening and who've been inspired what can people do to support your vision? Well, I'm, I'm looking for, um, I'm actually looking for um, investors for my, um, for my company. Um, I, I have equity available. People that can sponsor the beginning of um, a shelter, you know, um, I'm looking for counselors who are willing to come to Zambia and train people on how to counsel women who've been in violent relationships, um, mm -hmm. girls who've been sexually abused. Um, I'm looking for doctors who can at least come to Zambia two or three times a year and, um, and give um, mental care. Because unfortunately, um, you'll find that a lot of the girls that have been raped end up with HIV um, or some horrible STD. And um, yeah. and as I said, um, a lot of these, I mean, the, med the medication is there, but, you know, when it comes to children who've been abused, they need extra special care. Um, so I'm looking yeah. for any professional in that way um, mm -hmm. that, can, can, that can help this um, become um, a reality for me and for the women in Zambia. And I should actually emphasize that it's not just women, you're getting more and more cases of men who are being abused in their home. Of course. Um, more, more and more cases of, of boys being raped, you know. So um, it's not just women and girls, it's everybody. And it's people suffering in silence for no, for no reason. And, you know, I feel that this is where um, my heart really is. I, when it comes to the actual Bright Future project, um, 
and the investment and the evolution of the company. Um, we are um, currently looking at starting um, tree planting programs to so that we can take advantage um, of the of the carbon credits facilities yes. um, that, that are there. Um, and we also have MTN, which is the equivalent of Vodafone or EE, um, mm -hmm. who want to um, work with the Bright Future Project when it comes to our environmental agenda and the workshops that I give um, to women in rural areas um, on how they can, you know, generate businesses. But it's not just about generating businesses. We teach them about the links between um, bad waste disposal and public health. We show them yeah. the links between landfills and climate change, you know, um, and then we go into the circular economy. We teach them that waste is a resource. Um, every bit of paper, glass, um, plastic on the floor actually equates to something. It actually equates to, um, to, 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 to some kind of money in, in some form. Absolutely. So, um, yeah, so our workshops, you know, have really helped a lot of people, actually. I don't get paid for them. I just do them for free. Um, um, and then the local the local hotel or lodge um, will put me up for free um, because of the work that I'm doing. Um, so that's really how um, I've been I've been operating. Mm -hmm. um, as for our client, our client base, it's growing more and more because yes, there are really big waste management companies in Zambia, but um, who well, of course are, are much bigger than me. You have to forgive me about this. Something going on with my plugs. Um, there are very very big waste waste management companies in Zambia. Um, but um, they just take their waste to the landfill. Um, yeah, they, and they it, I'm guessing it, it just it either just gets buried or burned. Yeah, buried or burned, basically. Yeah, and they don't seem to care. So we have a niche. We actually have a niche. Um, it grows. Um, the big companies have realised that we have a niche, and now MTN would like to come on board. Um, yeah. They've been quite busy in the last um, week because they had um, a, a competition that was happening. But this week, um, we're going to finalise on what they need, um, how they want to work with us, and, and, and what the future holds, which is a very exciting prospect for me. So that's something that keeps me going and, you know, I, I feel very excited about. Um, tomorrow, we're talking with a potential um, investor as well, um, which is which I feel lucky to really have found, to be honest. And um, he's been in waste management for 26 years. So he has and, some experience. That's always, really good. He has the experience that I need. I always knew that I, I couldn't be um, MD forever. I knew that at some point I'd have to step down and let somebody who actually has the know-how um, to evolve the company. Because from my end, it merely just began as a passion um, when I was lying in a hospital bed. But I am ready to step down, to be honest. Um, it, what would be your parting gift of wisdom for those who are listening like if you just had on a personal level if you had one thing that you wanted to impart today what would it be my parting gift of wisdom is that people will always tell you that your idea is oh it, it will never work you know oh you know they, they, people will make you feel like a dreamer but what you realize what you have to realize is that our our dreams are big for a reason, and that's because we're supposed to act on them. Regardless of whether you succeed or not, the fact that you've tried in the first place um, goes a long way. So never let people, let, never let anybody, whoever they are, tell you that um, your vision is not going to go anywhere or, or anything negative to deter you. If you have peace in your heart if if your vision and your dream gives you peace 
then it's the right thing to do. And don't listen to people, just go for it 110%. Put your focus on it, be prepared to suffer, be prepared to find haters, but that's all part of entrepreneurship. You know, suffering is part of being an entrepreneur, unfortunately. And if you're not ready to suffer, if you're not ready to sleep hungry one or two nights, miss a few bills and, you know, have a zero balance in your bank account, then entrepreneurship is just not for you. That was really well said, and I cannot agree more. (laughs) Oh, entrepreneurship is... Wow. So yeah, yeah. My family never supported me. They never asked me. You know, till yeah. this day, they'll never ask me. You know, how's your business going? They, they just don't care because once people think that you're a loser, you know, there's nothing that you can actually say to them for them yeah. to, um, not to think that it's only your actions so actions speak louder than words so speak less and act more yeah that's for sure I love that I absolutely love that (laughs) 